Pavel Durov is one of the greatest Russian founders and businessmen of all time. He's worth $15.5 billion today, but he is exiled from the country. Now, the reason for that we'll get to later, but the reason why he's a billionaire is because he's the founder of Telegram, which is an incredible company that has spent no money on marketing, has only 30 employees, and almost a billion monthly active users. And when I first started learning about Pavel Durov, I learned about Telegram and I was like, whoa, this is an incredible company. But the story of how Telegram was created is even more incredible. He is one of the most mysterious men in tech who defied Putin's government and lives in exile as a result. And he's shredded as hell, as you can see by his Instagram. So by the end of this video, you'll know all the questions, you'll know the answers to the questions I had. How he created the Russian Facebook back in the day, why he is exiled from Russia, why he created Telegram in the first place, and then the most important, the reason for thirst traps on IG. So let's get into it. Pavel Durov was born in 1984 in the Soviet Union, which is a funny year for his story, considering so much of it is based around freedom from oppression. Despite being born in the USSR, his family moved to Italy at the age of four, and he spoke no Italian. All of the teachers said that he was going to be a failure. They didn't believe in him at all, and this probably gave Pavel a bit of a chip on his shoulder, because by the end of the first year, he was second in his class, and by the end of his second year, he was first in his class. Despite the Italian teachers not believing in him, Pavel immediately preferred the Western system of governance and society to the system back in the USSR. He saw the liberal values of freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and he preferred the capitalist system a lot more. And then when he was seven years old, everything changed because in 1991, the USSR collapsed. And because of that, his family moved back to St. Petersburg. Whoa. And because of that, his family moved back to St. Petersburg from Italy, and they bring something that is super valuable with them. You see in the new Russian Federation that was founded, almost no one had a computer, but because they were in Italy, they had one. And so they bring their IBM computer, one of the few in Russia at the time, and it allows Pavel and his brother to study programming and get a head start over everyone else in the country. So the seeds of Pavel's future are already being planted. He and his brother are learning programming when almost no one else is. And at his core, he has seen the difference between the authoritarian Soviet Union and the liberal capitalist Western world. And then in September of 2006, his story really begins. I was three years old, but Pavel had just launched his new website, Vcontakte. I think I said that right, I hope. Otherwise known as VK for short. And anyone who is from Russia or Belarus or Kazakhstan or any of these post-Soviet countries will know about VK. But if you're in the West, you've probably never heard of it. Well, VK was and is the Facebook of Russia and the post-Soviet countries. And it was actually a lot better than Facebook in some ways. Even Zuckerberg had to admit that they could not beat VK. There were so many other countries that tried to have their own Facebook, the Facebook of Brazil, the Facebook of South Africa, the Facebook of China. But in many of these places, Facebook became the Facebook of Brazil and etc. But in the post-Soviet states like Russia, Kazakhstan, Belarus, VK won. And they had a lot of better features and they understood their user base better. Now for a while there, Pavel was the only coder, designer, customer support, and server maintainer for VK while it was growing exponentially in Russia. While he was still in school, by the way. So he was incredibly busy. <laughs> I mean, he himself says he was working 17, 20 hours a day, I believe, in one of his interviews. He was so busy that he did not even bother to pick up his diploma when he graduated. But that's probably okay because VK was doing so well. By 2012, he was on top of the world. They had 100 million active users, which for 2012 is a lot. That's a big deal. And Pavel was a bit of a celebrity in the East. <laughs> he um, had a famous incident called the Money Airplanes, where there was a crowd gathered outside of his headquarters in St. Petersburg, and he and his friends folded up about $150 worth of money folded them to paper airplanes and threw them down into the crowd. And so he was constantly in the news for different stunts like this. So VK was doing great, but a few years later is when the problems began. Because in 2012, Russia saw the largest protests since the fall of the Soviet Union. It's a big deal. There was almost half a million people taking to the streets in Moscow. And this is because Putin was running for another term. Now, at the time, Putin's government told Pavel to ban the VK communities that were organizing the protests. And Pavel ignored them. He said, no, we're not going to comply. He still remembered the difference between Italy and the Soviet Union. 
and he still had those Western values of freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, core in his heart, core, core to his ideals. And uh, Pavel got away with it this time, but this would not be the last time the Russian government came knocking because in 2015, the government now demanded that he hand over the personal information of some protesters in Ukraine. They wanted the data for protesters in a different country. And Pavel again refused, but this time he went even further. He posted their request on VK, along with this picture of a dog in a hoodie. I don't know why the dog is there. It's kind of hilarious. But he posted the entire government request on VK. He said, they want your data. I will never give it to them. And this time, the government was not playing around. So Pavel was given a choice. He could either start complying with the requests, or he could sell his stake in the company, resign, and leave the country forever. Well, of course, we know how this story ends. Pavel chose exile, and he sold his stake in VK for $300 million. Pretty good payday. But now he was exiled from his home. It was a hard choice to make. I think it's, <laughs> when Pavel talks about it, he seems to care less about being exiled from Russia and more about the fact that he lost control over his first company, VK, his baby. But at the end of the day, he said, I would rather be free. I don't want to take orders from anyone. That's the most important thing to him. And so we've talked about how he created the Russian Facebook, why he's exiled from Russia, but he's not even known that much for VK today. He's known for Telegram, one of the biggest you know, social networks in the world. So let's talk about the creation of Telegram. How did that happen? Well, he had a problem. While in Russia, he had been raided by the SWAT team at one point. And when that happened, he called his brother and realized that he had no secure way to communicate with him. The feds could understand everything he was saying. And so after obtaining a new citizenship, he paid about $30,000 for it. He and his brother got to work. I don't know why I capitalized this all weird. I apologize. So unprofessional. My God. His brother now has two PhDs and is a world math champion. He's a math genius. And so they leave Russia, they get a new citizenship, and they write, and his brother writes the encryption standard for Telegram, which is their new secure messaging app, a text messenger with encryption and privacy built in the foundation. And so Pavel focused on UI design and they run into a new problem. Where should they set up their new company? Because they're actually from Russia. They tried Berlin, they tried London, they tried Singapore, but there's too much bureaucratic hurdles to setting up a business. For example, Pavel says that when he was in Berlin, he tried to hire some people from out of the country to come to the company because they were really good. But then the authorities in Berlin said, no, you have to try and hire native Germans first, you have to put an ad in the newspaper, you have to da 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 just trying to boss him around. And if there's one thing we've learned, Pavel hates that. <laughs> and he got kind of insulted by the fact that there was so much bureaucracy in all these places, because in his mind, he's trying to bring an incredible company, incredible world-class engineers to your city, but they just kept throwing obstacles in his way. And so that really bothered him. And he thought that San Francisco might be the place to go for their new tech company. That's where every other tech company is. Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple. They're all in, well, Microsoft's in Seattle, but whatever. Most of the main tech companies and the social media companies especially are in San Francisco. He even visited the city and met with Jack Dorsey, who was the CEO of Twitter at the time. And when Jack was giving him a tour of the office, Pavel noticed that, you know, there was a lot of people. And so he asked Jack, he was like, hey, why does Twitter have this many employees? Like you could probably run the place with 30 people, right? Like it's just like, text on the screen. It's not that complicated. And Jack said he actually agreed with Pavel. But the reason why Twitter has so many employees is because if they fired anyone, people on Wall Street would get scared and it would hurt the stock price. And so Pavel had learned another new lesson. When you have a public company, when you have other people invested in your company, you lose so much control. You have to make inefficient decisions, bad decisions, to cater to the shareholders. So maybe SF was the place, but then there was kind of a bad omen. After leaving the Twitter HQ, a group of men tried to mug Pavel and take away his phone, but they didn't really know who they were messing with because he fought them off and he posted this tweet. Just got into a fight with guys who tried to grab my phone near Mission 980. Scary neighborhood, not for a Russian punch emoji. So he goes to SF, he meets with Jack Doors, he gets into a fight. It's not the best impression. And there's a few other reasons with America in general, which is why he didn't want to settle there. And number one was the security agencies. He says that every time he enters America, the FBI greets him at the airport. They just say hello, which is a really creepy thing to do. He said even one time when he was in America, the FBI showed up to his rental 
rental house for breakfast where he was staying at. So they were making it very clear that they had an eye on him and they wanted to work with him. And he didn't like all that attention. The U.S. government even attempted to hire one of his engineers so they could begin to backdoor telegram, find a way in. So he needed a neutral country to live in that was also business friendly. And there's really only one place in the world that fits those standards, and that is the UAE or Dubai specifically is in the crossroads between the East and the West. It's a neutral country geopolitically, and they're also incredibly business friendly. And he's been in Dubai ever since. So they solved the location problem. But Telegram, as always, has a new problem. They have a lot of users, but they're still unprofitable. Classic tech company issue. And so investors begin to make offers to Pavel as Telegram begins to grow. They say, listen, we'll give you 10% or will take 10% at a $30 billion valuation of your company. What does that mean? That means investors would pay Pavel $3 billion to take just 10% of his company, one-tenth. He turned them down. And so they came back with a new offer. Hey, 10% at a $40 billion valuation. $4 billion for a small stake in your company. You would still control 90% of it. And again, he turned them down. You see, Pavel does not want to give up any control over the company, at least not yet. He still remembered visiting Jack Dorsey's Twitter and the, and the decisions that Jack was forced to make because he gave up control. He was able to deny the Russian government's requests when he ran VK because he had full control. But if he had investors taking parts of Telegram and governments began to make demands of Telegram, would Pavel be able to tell them to screw off. I don't want to swear because it hurts my RPM. I get less money from the ads. But <laughs> would he be able to tell them to bug off? Maybe not. Maybe the investors would take away his freedom. And so after selling VK, he has had millions of dollars in bank accounts and Bitcoin for years. But Pavel doesn't have any yachts, any cars, any land. He says, for me, I would rather make decisions that would influence how a billion people communicate rather than choosing the color of seats in a house that only I and my friends and relatives will see. Very unusual, very unusual. So there's a few advantages to not taking investor money. Number one, you can keep growing the company and then you know, sell it for more money later. Number two, you keep your control. You don't have to kowtow to investors or governments. You can tell everyone to screw off if you want to. And number three is that you have a lot of speed. You can move really fast. Telegram has 30 engineers and one product manager. The product manager is Pavel. And so they're able to implement new features, they're able to pivot, they're able to change way faster than any other social media company can. No HR department, no customer support, no giant sales teams. It really is an incredible company. And so with all that in mind, Pavel has yet to sell any equity or go public, but he did solve the money problem in a few ways. Uh, number one, he sold, he raised some debt to raise some money. He also launched a cryptocurrency project, which, you know, is kind of going public, but kind of not. So he's in the gray area there. Um, but he has not sold any equity in the company. And at the time of this video, Telegram has grown to almost a billion monthly active users as the secure and encrypted and private messaging platform of a huge chunk of the world. And ironically, it's used by some of the top members in Russia's government <laughs> because it's so neutral and secure. Even after being exiled, they still have to use this product. So we've covered how he created the Facebook, why he's exiled, the creation of Telegram, and now the most important, why does he post these thirst traps on IG? Well, in 2017, he decided to make fun of, Put of, of Putin's shirtless pictures. And he posted this on Telegram. My Instagram had to seriously step up the game to keep up with the increased competition from Mr. Putin's shirtless photos. If you're Russian, you have to join the, Putless, the Putin shirtless challenge or face oblivion. Two rules, no Photoshop, no pumping. Otherwise, you're not an alpha. What a legend. Subscribe if you like the video.